Reversible steady flow work is a really important topic because while we've studied closed systems, when we've talked about boundary work, and that is certainly useful and interesting, there are many open systems, systems that have steady flow. Now, there aren't, well, there are actually some cars still in existence that use steady flow in order to generate power rather than using a piston in a closed system to generate power. Uh, if you ever heard of the Chrysler uh, turbine car, it was an open system. It uses it used turbines and compressor wheels in order to you know compress and expand air, and then expand the air more during expansion than was than was compressed because you've added thermal energy to it, and so it wants to expand more, and thereby get a net amount of work out. So the, the, although this is not common in cars anymore, and it really was never common in cars. There are engines that involve steady flow work. Uh, turbine engines, for example, in helicopters or even tanks. The M1 uh, Abrams uses uh, a, a turbine type of engine. Uh, and I really am interested in turbine engines for uh, automobile applications because I really wish Chrysler had been able to continue uh, their development work. They were getting pretty far along. If I remember right, they got to about a, a fifth generation on their engine. This was back in the 60s. And way before I was born, and uh, really interesting stuff, I think, because they could burn, you know, waste grease. They could burn oil directly. They could burn perfume. Uh, it was very fuel flexible, and you know, a lot of energy is is wasted in refining oil into the various fuels that we use. And so it'd be nice if you could just put crude oil in your car and burn it directly, and it, you know, it would have to come out with you know, meeting emissions and so forth. But I think that with today's computer controls, we could probably do a whole lot better with a turbine engine in a vehicle than they could do back then. Because, you know, yeah, there were computers back in the 60s and early 70s, but they certainly weren't high-speed uh, computing with large amounts of memory. And sensors certainly weren't developed to the level that they are today. So anyway, so open steady flow work is certainly important. We're going to talk about reversible steady flow work. And you may say, well, wait a second. I hate that idea of reversibility. I mean, I know it would generate the most, but it seems so theoretical. Well, do you realize that the closed system uh, reversible or the closed system work that we came up with before, the integral of PDV, that was a reversible form of work because we assumed that there was no friction between the piston and the sidewalls. We assumed that there was no fast expansion or compression of the gases that were doing work or that work was being done on. And so, the integral of PDV, the boundary work equation that we've come to know and love or revile and hate, I don't know where you are in that, that equation is already a reversible equation. And so if we're going to talk about open systems, we will need some equation like this in order to quantify how much work we get out of uh, you know, running fluid through a, uh, a turbine, for example. So we will start with an energy balance around this device. We'll think of it as a turbine. And the amount of reversible steady flow work we get out, or you know, we'll think of fluid flowing through this turbine and a very small amount of uh, change in that fluid. So the enthalpy of the fluid may drop a little bit. The kinetic energy may drop a little bit. The potential energy may go up a little bit. It doesn't matter. If that the energy of the fluid changes, it has to go somewhere. And we're going to... Uh, write an energy balance around the fluid and say, well, it must go into some small amount of reversible steady flow work. Now, remember, we've got the TDS equation or the TDS equation. We've used it several times, and we can write the term TDS in terms of differential changes in enthalpy and also the specific volume times differential changes in pressure. So as this fluid goes through, it's certainly going to change its pressure, right? Think of a steam turbine. As the steam comes in, it's under high pressure, and as it expands in the turbine, its pressure drops, okay? So if that's the case, then we can rearrange this and solve for dH, the enthalpy as, uh, or the change in enthalpy, the differential change as TDS plus VDP. Now, noticing that the uh, amount of heat transfer for a reversible system is TDS, or the, the infinitesimal amount of heat transfer is TDS, we can make a whole lot of, su of substitutions. We'll begin by plugging in DQ for TDS into our basically definition of, well, it's not the definition of enthalpy, it's our TDS equation. And then plug that in for the enthalpy in the energy balance. When we do that, then we've got an equation that includes heat transfer during the process as well as 
uh, any reversible steady flow work. Now we'll integrate this equation from the inlet to the exit and we'll, we're going to separate it out into two parts. One part involving the heat transfer and the other one involving the, the other terms, the change in kinetic energy and the change in potential energy. And the VDP is an, another change in the fluid's energy, right? And it, obviously if the specific volume of the fluid changes, well then it has to be integrated over the pressure change. So this is, this is like flow work, okay? This is the flow work of the fluid. Now, since we're dealing with a reversible system, we can't have any heat transfer. So that term has to go away if we're going to use this and apply it. So if our piece of equipment has any heat transfer, that's not reversible and this equation won't work for it. But if there's no heat transfer, then this equation should work fine. And you may not know this, but steam turbines are often insulated in order to prevent heat transfer. You end up with more energy out of the turbine in the form of work if you do not allow heat transfer. And there's multiple reasons for that, but we won't go into them right now. Now, a lot of times the change in kinetic energy of say steam flowing through a turbine and the change in the potential energy, the, the gravitational change from inlet to exit, are so small that they're not really worth talking about. And what we're left with is an important equation that allows us to calculate the reversible steady flow work in terms of the specific volume of the fluid flowing through and the change in pressure of that fluid. We have to integrate from inlet to exit, but there it is. And it's kind of striking the resemblance between the reversible steady flow work for an open system and the reversible work for a closed system. One is integral of PDV, the other one is integral of VDP, but of course there's a negative sign. And the reason there's a negative sign in the reversible steady flow work is because we always want to think of work coming out of the system as being a positive thing. So just like with the boundary work uh, equation that we had before, work out is, is positive. For this equation, this reversible steady flow work, which applies to open systems uh, that are reversible, uh, this equation assumes that work flowing out is positive and that negative sign is needed in order to uh, adhere to that sign convention. So there's the equation that would be involved in a compressor or a turbine or any other type of uh, open steady flow piece of equipment uh, that is either doing work or accepting work uh, in. Now if we put the kinetic and potential energy changes back into the equation and don't neglect them, we can talk about the reversible work for an incompressible fluid. If the fluid is incompressible, that means its specific volume doesn't change, right? Its density doesn't change. So we can pull that outside of the integral. And if we then simply realize we're left with the integral of dp, well that's a difference in pressure between inlet and exit, p2 minus p1. And there are actually many systems where this is a useful equation, like pumps, for example. Okay, so we can calculate how much uh, pump work we could get out if the pump was reversible based on this equation, right? If you know the pressure change that has to be accomplished, say, you know, pressure comes in at 100 kilopascals and the fluid leaves at one megapascal, and we're talking about water or oil moving through this pump, well, then the specific volume of the pump times that pressure change is part of the energy that has to be supplied to the pump in order to increase the, the flow energy of the fluid. However, any kinetic energy change and any lift, any potential energy change of that fluid also has to be provided by work coming into the pump. And understand we're talking about the work per unit mass. That's why we've been dealing in lowercase letters for quite a while now. Now there are other systems where there is no work interaction and so there's no work flowing into or out of that section and so there's a zero on the left hand side and you probably don't recognize this in its form but if I change it into this form you may recognize it. Maybe you've had a fluids class where you dealt with you know the uh, velocity head and the, the static head or the, the gravitational head as well as the uh, pressure head in pipe for example. Okay, that is what this equation is good for and it's called Bernoulli's equation. The reason you may not recognize it is because a lot of times there's some other, there's some rearrangement that's usually done. For example, the acceleration of gravity G is usually divided through the whole thing. So you have V squared, you know, V2 squared minus V1 squared over 2G. 
and you, so you have a G under the uh, pressure difference as well. But also, instead of using specific volume, they usually use density, which is the inverse. So if you multiply what ends up being in the de denominator under P2 minus P1, the acceleration of gravity times density, you get the specific volume of the fluid, which is usually written as gamma. And so you've got your, your uh, pressure head, your velocity head, and your elevation head, and this is just Bernoulli's equation. So it's kind of interesting that Bernoulli's equation can be derived from an energy balance for an open steady flow, well not necessarily steady flow, but for an open system. And of course Bernoulli's equation applies to all sorts of things, uh, carburetors for example, uh, airplane wings, uh, all sorts of things use Bernoulli's equation. And understand with, with all these different types of devices, there's, there's no work interaction, right? There's nothing uh, adding energy to the fluid uh, from work, there's, nothing, there's no work being extracted from the fluid. And so this is a very useful equation. In fact, it's the basis of whole courses, right, on fluids. Now, how would we maximize or minimize work? I mean, if we we're going to go through the trouble of building a turbine, for example, we'd really like for that turbine to get out as much work as possible. But if we build a compressor that's a steady flow compressor, a lot of compressors you've probably dealt with are, are reciprocating compressors. So they, they have a piston that moves and pressurizes air, for example. But there are larger systems that are compressors that are continuous. They have compressor blades, they have wheels that turn at very high speeds and compress air that way. Um, they're more, they can be more efficient in higher volume applications. But this reversible steady flow work equation we've got where we've neglected the kinetic and potential energy changes again suggests something very important about maximizing and minimizing work. Now we're not actually performing the integration but hopefully this visual will help you a little bit. If the specific volume is fairly large, you would expect the integral of that specific volume uh, over the changes in pressure to also generate a larger amount of work. So as the specific volume of a fluid gets bigger and bigger, in other words the density gets lower and lower, the amount of work you can get out of it by it doing work for you or the amount of work you have to put in in order to get it to compress and change pressure gets bigger. Okay. And that's something really important because what that means is if we have a turbine, we'd like for that turbine to use fluid, and I don't mean liquid, I mean a gas, that has as uh, low a density as possible, right? As high a specific volume, because that will maximize the turbine's output. Whereas if we have a compressor wheel, what we'd like to do is compress gases that are already as dense as possible, that have low specific volume. And that will minimize the amount of work that has to go into the compressor. As a matter of fact, you may have a car that has a turbocharger on it. I've got two of them. They, they're not really fast. A lot of people think that when you put a turbocharger on a car, it just makes it a, a racing car. And while turbos are used for racing cars, they're also used for diesel engines. And so Cummins, for example, uh, will actually tune their engines in a sense by determining how many turbochargers to put on them and exactly what the size of the wheels should be and a lot of specifications for their, for their various customers because you know their customers have different applications for these very large engines and the easiest way to change the engine significantly is to change the the characteristics of you know the, the blowers essentially the turbochargers that are pushing air into the engine now if you know anything about a turbocharger really it consists of two parts and they're connected by a shaft there's a compressor wheel and there's a turbine wheel and what happens is the exhaust gases coming out of the car drive the turbine wheel, which drives the shaft, which connects to the compressor wheel, so that the air coming into the engine is no longer so-called naturally aspirated. The engine's no, no, no longer naturally aspirated. It doesn't just open up an intake valve, pull the piston down, and the atmosphere push air into the engine. Rather, the compressor wheel pulls in, engine, pulls in air from the atmosphere, or better yet, the atmosphere pushes air in, but then that that compressor wheel compresses it, right? It, it makes the pressure higher. Now, if you make the pressure high, that's great. That's a good thing because you can push more air into the engine. The problem is, as you compress the air, it, it warms up. And as, it's, as it warms up, as it temp its temperature gets higher, its density decreases, okay? So uh, its specific volume increases. And that's a problem because if you take that, that air that's already expanded, it, it can't expand as much, right? You'd like to condense it down a little bit, and that's the whole reason for having an intercooler. Well, I guess it's also good that you don't blow the head off the, the car when you compress the air again with the, the piston, but the whole idea is to cool down the air so it becomes more dense and less specific volume, so it doesn't take as much work to compress the, the, uh, the air in the piston, because it's going to be compressed again after the compressor wheel,
but also of course the pressure doesn't go too high and you uh, damage the the engine so this is a really important thing because it tells us something about the idea that maybe even at this point you, you heard me mention it earlier but you may still think well I don't see why we couldn't do that because if you think about a typical power plant system that operates on a steam cycle the boiler takes in liquid water boils it off and you know that takes a lot of energy right when you take water from the liquid phase to the gas phase there's a significant amount of latent energy you have to put into that water to get it to boil off okay so that's what's done in the boiler and of course the boiler superheats the water it takes it beyond the saturated uh, vapor phase and then you run the super hot steam through a turbine but then you take that steam and what do you do to it you condense it out again you basically throw away all of that latent energy and it seems like it didn't help at all right it seems like it's almost as if we're trying to burn more coal or use more nuclear fuel and why are these engineers so stupid as to do this well actually it's a good thing to do this and the reason is not because it burns more coal but because it actually burns less okay coal uh, coal-fired power plants have to pay for the coal they burn they don't want it to cost anything right they'd like for it to be free so they're gonna burn as little of it as possible they're gonna make their systems as efficient as possible and when they're not efficient anymore they're gonna go get another one right just like you you might you know if you're driving your grandparents car around it's probably time for an upgrade right a 50 year old car uh, so anyway the whole reason for doing this is because think about it if you have steam on the turbine side you've got a fluid that has a very high specific volume or a very low density it's going to generate a lot of work in the turbine but on the pump side since we're dealing with a liquid which has a very high density or a very low specific volume the amount of work required in the pump to pump the liquid back up to the boiler pressure which is a heck of a lot higher than the condenser pressure that amount of work is actually really small if we did not have the condenser or if we didn't condense it all the way out to liquid we'd have to have a compressor on the side compressing a gas where the specific volume would be very large and therefore the amount of work required would be very large doesn't mean it's impractical in all situations but for a, a, an installation that doesn't have to move or doesn't have to fly uh, you know coal-fired power plant this would be horrible because so much of the energy generated by the turbine would go into the compressor in order to recompress the steam in other words if you do the analysis what you find is that it's better to throw away the latent energy of the water rather than to compress the water as a gas it's much better to compress it as a liquid so it's it's easy to find processes where you've got you know a 250 megawatt turbine for example being you know using a pump that may only be a thousand horsepower or you know, 700 kilowatts there we go about roughly 700 kilowatts so 700 kilowatts by comparison to 250 megawatts I mean that's like comparing you know 250 million dollars to 700 what thousand dollars right there's 250 million is a whole lot bigger than 700,000 so it makes a lot of sense to do this whereas if we had a, uh, a you know a, a compressor like this we'd be taking easily a hundred megawatts to back drive the compressor and it's much better to throw away as I said the latent energy in the water you actually end up ahead now another place where this can be used we can finally explain why air compressors use cooling fins the reason they use cooling fins is because you're gonna throw away the some of the energy in the the air that you compressed anyway right it's going to go into a tank and it's going to cool down anyway so while you might think that cooling down is not good because now we don't have an isentropic process and an isentropic compression and so it won't be you know we won't transfer as much energy into the air as we would like well it doesn't matter because we're just trying to compress the air it's going to cool down anyway so we're not interested in all of the energy going into the air necessarily and staying there we're interested in putting the energy into the air that will stay in an efficient way and so if the air is cooled as it is compressed what that means is that its specific volume will go down because its density will go up and will actually require less work to compress and so that's why you'll see air compressors always having cooling fins and even this one has a cooling fan uh, to enhance the uh, it looks like a cooling fan I guess I shouldn't say that I know that's a belt guard but uh, I believe that's also a fan that blows air across the fins that you can see on this apparently dual stage compressor so what about compressing gases well you can compress them a couple of different ways if you compress them isentropically then 
there's a certain amount of work required to do that. Well, how much is it? Well, we've got an equation for calculating it, right? Because the reversible steady flow work equation says integrate the specific volume over the change of pressure. So if we have a PV diagram, and this is over, all over in the gas phase, okay? There's no vapor dome here. This is all not liquid. This is vapor. Uh, for this, we've got volume on the x-axis, pressure on the right axis. What are we really doing when we say integrate the specific volume over the change of pressure? Well, we're, we've got our differential changes on the y-axis now, so we're really talking about a specific uh, area. And if we integrate isentropically, what does that mean? Well, that means we need to know how the specific volume de depends on pressure in an isentropic process. We've already got an isentropic equation that tells us. Remember, we've got the first, second, and third isentropic equation. Yeah, they're not perfect. They do assume constant heat capacity, but over the range of compression uh, temperatures that we typically uh, see in compressors, it's an adequate equation. And, and basically, you can write it another way than what I, I wrote it earlier as the first isentropic equation. You can write it as PV to the K equals a constant. It's, it's the same thing as what we had before. So what is that? Well, that is this particular area, right? That, that's the area that we're talking about that the, the integral is, is adding up. That area represents the amount of reversible steady flow work in the isentropic compression case. Now, you can derive the equation uh, after, you, after you plug in, you know, PV to the K is a constant, after you solve for the specific volume and plug uh, in the specific volume in terms of pressure and then perform the integration, you come out to the equation you see here. Again, we're assuming that this is an ideal gas. So you come out to this reversible steady flow work uh, equation for a compressor as the, uh, you know, when we're, it's, it's work we have to put in to compress the gas. Now, obviously, the gas is going to go from an initial temperature to a final temperature that will be higher, okay? But here's the equation for it, and we can rewrite it in a slightly different way, going back to the fact that it's an ideal gas and subbing in, you know, pressures and things instead of the temperatures. If we have a polytropic process, in other words, if we can make the gas behave polytropically as we compress it, well, then the shape of the process curve is different. And in fact, a polytropic process looks a lot like an isentropic process. It's just PV to the N equals a constant, where N is the polytropic uh, uh, exponent. And it turns out that the polytropic exponent N will always be between 1 and K, where K is the ratio of heat capacities, which is what would make it an isentropic process. Okay. If that's the case, then going through the math again, realizing that the, you know, the specific volume is equal to the pressure to the 1 over N power, plug that into the, the integral, perform the integration. Here's where we come out. It looks exactly like what we had before. It's just we've got N instead of K, right? Now notice these equations are in the back of the chapter. You need to go and find them now. You need to mark them. These are all compressor equations, okay? So these are equations that will allow you to calculate how much work is required to compress a gas from one state to another in a re reversible steady flow uh, way. If we have an isothermal process, what does that mean? Well, that means PV equals a constant. Well, how do we know that? Well, remember the ideal gas law, PV equals MRT. If the temperature is constant, then M, R, and T on the right-hand side of the equation are all constants. Therefore, PV is a constant. So you see the logical progression here from PV to the K, PV to the N, and PV, where V is now raised to the first power, instead of being raised to K or N. So this is an easy one, right? Because all we have is 1 over P equals V. Plug that in, we'll end up with a natural logarithm from the integration, and here's where we end up. So RT, natural logarithm of the pressure ratio. All three of these equations are in the back of the chapter, I believe. If they're not, you need to add them, but I'm about 99% positive they're all there. Notice that the isothermal, the constant temperature compression process, has the least area under the curve. In other words, it requires the least amount of work in order to compress the gas. So again, this is the mathematical proof for the reason why we should cool the gas as we compress it. And again, this may seem counterintuitive because all along the way I've been saying, well, reversible's the best, right? Isentropic's the best. Why doesn't it come out to be the best here? Well, when I say the best in the terms of isentropic processes, what I'm trying to say is being efficient in transferring energy from work coming in to fluid energy coming out, right? The isentropic process will certainly maintain more of the energy 
in the gas as it comes out, but it'll be at a high temperature, which is worthless to us because it's going to cool down anyway. So we may as well put less energy into the gas in the first place and go ahead and keep it at constant temperature if possible. Obviously, it's not, it's not really practical to compress a gas at a, a perfectly uh, isothermal temperature most of the time. It will heat up a little bit, but we want to get more towards that isothermal side because it will minimize the, the cost of the work that goes into pressurizing the gas because we're really not interested in increasing the thermal energy of the gas which is what isentropic compression would be particularly good at.